Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicle, a series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Benjamin Harrison, and the focus is the war years. The year is 1862, and Harrison has just finished recruiting a regiment, a thousand men, ready to join the Union Army and go off to war. In fact, they got a rousing send-off in Indianapolis, the state capital of Indiana, as they left for their first assignment, which was to head to Louisville, Kentucky. And this was an arduous journey for these citizen soldiers. These aren't military men. This was a whole new experience to then travel as a group by ferry and train and a whole bunch of marching. They were exhausted when they got to Louisville, but they only had a couple of days to rest up before they had to go on to their first real assignment, which was Bowling Green, Kentucky, just about 30 miles from the Tennessee border. The Indiana 70th had a lot to learn, both the men and the officers, including their Colonel Benjamin Harrison. Harrison wasn't a military man. He had military books. He was studying at night, training his men the next day based on what he had learned the night before. And that training started at five o'clock in the morning, went all day long till eight o'clock at night. They were at this for about a month. And it wasn't just about learning the military arts. Harrison knew with these citizen soldiers, he had to instill discipline. They had to be prepared to take the fight, stand in a line and fight back. And that meant life or death to the soldiers and the men who were next to them. So he had very little tolerance for folks getting out of line. Discipline was gonna be a key element if they were gonna be effective and frankly stay alive. Now, the key attack that they were gonna actually go after was a group of raiders under Confederate General John Morgan. He had about 1,200 cavalry in the area, and they were issuing these raids on railroads and bridges. It was not just a nuisance. It was actually quite destructive in the entire region. And the Union Army got a little break because they got some intel as a big chunk of Morgan's men were believed to be encamped in Russellville. And that's where the Indiana 70th were set off to go after these men. And just on the eve of this first battle for Harrison, he wrote his wife a letter. He said, should I never see you and the dear children again, you must comfort yourself by the rich grace of God, which is all sufficient, and that the dear little ones be taught to meet me in heaven. Keep my memory green in their young hearts. And again, God bless you, yours is ever in the tenderest love. With that, Colonel Ben Harrison and the Indiana 70th were off to battle. They took a train, about 600 of those soldiers went, went with them. They got uh, out just short of the town and Harrison started to apply what he had been learning just recently. He took his major, S.C. Vance, sent him and some of his men around to the other side of town so they could block any escape by Morgan's men. And then Harrison initiated the attack. He led it personally. They caught the enemy completely off guard. This was a huge victory for Harrison and his men. The enemy suffered 35 killed, many more wounded. For Harrison and the Indiana 70th, none killed, only one wounded in the entire skirmish. They also captured about 45 good horses, about 50 guns, dozen prisoners. This was a grand triumph for the Indiana 70th. It was also the last combat that these men would see for about the next two years. Other things going on in Harrison's life, well, he had kept his job his state elected position as the reporter of the state Supreme Court in Indiana. His job was being done by somebody that he had hired to take those court cases from the Supreme Court, write them up, issue the books, send them out and sell them to the lawyers. And they were then splitting the profits with Harrison's family getting some, this other person getting the rest. But the Democrats cried foul. They said, look, you can't be getting money from that job and still officially be in it if you're getting a full-time salary from the federal government and the Union Army. And the courts agreed and Harrison was out. He's pretty disappointed that his Republican friends didn't do much to kind of stop this. He was also very disappointed in the loss of income. But again, he had other things to worry about, but for now that political tie had been severed. There are others goings on uh, as well in the country at the time. There was a period in 1862, again, the war was not going well for the North. Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States, believed he needed to do something to invigorate the war effort. And he settled upon his Emancipation Proclamation. And after the victory at Antietam, a very bloody battle in September of 1862, Lincoln issued his draft Emancipation Proclamation, which said in 100 days, any state or territory that's still in rebellion against the United States, if you have slaves, they are now and forever will be free. That was the determination of Lincoln. It would go into effect on January 1st, 1863. This changed the nature of the war for many in the North. 
Many in the North were really in the fight to preserve the Union, less so to free the slaves. There were certainly many who were in favor of freeing the slaves, but there were others that was not the purpose that they felt in going to war. And the men in the Indiana 70th started getting letters from family and friends kind of questioning whether or not the purpose of the war had changed, are they still as committed to this? And there was a fair amount of noise in the regiment. So Harrison just brought everybody together, all thousand men, and he spent over an hour talking to them, calming them, emphasizing the need to preserve the Union as first and foremost. Yes, there are other benefits that are going to accrue from the war, but we need to stay focused on the task. We need to preserve the Union. And he was able to calm these men, gain that unity is so necessary amongst these citizen soldiers in case they needed to again go into another fight. Well, another fight wasn't forthcoming again for quite some time. Lincoln was again changing his command structure in the Union Army as Harris Harrison's regiment now fell under the brigade of William Ward, part of the corps of Major General William Rosecrans. Rosecrans was often criticized for, criticized for being slow to action, too much time on training, not enough actually going out and taking the fight to the enemy. So what did this period mean for Harrison and the Indiana 70th? Not much activity. They were guarding supply lines for months on end. At one point, they were sent off to Nashville to go back into Garrison, do some more training. They were actually pretty frustrated at all this inactivity. Well, in the battlefields in 1863, out west, Ulysses Grant and his men took care of Vicksburg. The, the siege was successful. This was the town on the Mississippi River that it basically opened up the Mississippi River to the entire north, to the north from entire uh, top to bottom. With that, Grant was given the con command of the entire Army of the Tennessee out west, followed that up with a victory in Chattanooga. After that, he was named Lieutenant General in charge of the entire war effort. William Sherman, a major general, took over the Army of the Tennessee, and his job was to chase the Confederates into Georgia. And finally, this is where the Indiana 70th was going to get back in the fight. But once again, there was news from home. Before the next battle, Harrison was told that his friends wanted to nominate him to be the state reporter again in the next election. Well, Harrison had other things on his mind, so here's what he told them. Should the war be ended, or virtually so, during the campaign now opening, as many hopeful ones believe, or should my usefulness in the Army be from any cause brought to an end, then I should be much gratified to resume the duties of reporter. You can go nominate me if you want, which they did, in the meantime, he's got a fight in his hands, and he had an aggressive march. He had to get quickly, him and his men, from Nashville to northern Georgia. They were covering about 10 to 12 miles a day through really tough slog. There was a lot of rain, a lot of mud, but this was a critical campaign. Grant and his men were actually bogged down in the state of Virginia going up against Confederate General Robert E. Lee. And Abraham Lincoln, in an election year, needed a military victory if he was going to get re-election and be able to continue the war effort. If if it took place beyond the, the end of the election cycle. And so for this, he was partly counting on Sherman to have a big victory, perhaps capturing Atlanta in the state of Georgia. The Indiana 70th now engages. The first battle in the, in the fight in Georgia actually took place in Dalton against the rebels. A Union victory, the rebels would push back, but in this, the Indiana 70th was largely in reserves. Not for the next fight. They arrived at Resaca, where the Confederate line had been uh, formed on May the 13th. The fight was going to be the next day. The Indiana 70th was going to be at the pointy end of the spear. And Harrison wrote his wife a letter. I love you, my dear wife, with all the devotion of a full heart. And my children is the apple of my eyes. But the obligations of a soldier are upon me. And these dear domestic ties are only the stronger incentive to quit myself well in the fight. Should I come alive through the fight to get home, I hope to see you all in good time. Farewell, and God bless you. The next day, the fight took place, May 14th. Harrison was at the top of a hill with his men. Uh, the, the enemy was about 100 yards away at the crest of another hill. He could see the enemy sharpshooters through his uh, binoculars. They could certainly see him as well. His orders dislodged the enemy from that other hill, and again, the Indiana 70th would be out front. They initiated the attack. They caught heavy musket fire com coming from the Confederates. Harrison urged his men on. They fought bravely, and in fact, Harrison himself was at the head of the column, and he wrote later that seeing that the infantry supports had deserted the artillery on the other side, I cheered the men forward. And with a wild yell, they entered the embrasures, striking down and bayoneting the gunners, many of whom defiantly stuck by their guns until 
until struck down. This was hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bayonets, muskets used as clubs, officers using their pistols, at po firing at point-blank range. Once again, Benjamin Harrison, the colonel of the Indiana 70th, was in the middle of the fight. Dan Ransdell was a member of this unit. He said Harrison standing up there right in front of the rebels, waving his sword in one hand and brandishing a revolver in the other. Remarkably cool under fire. No one ever saw him manifest the slightest indication of fear. The privates of his regiment would have died for him to a man. His call to them was always, come on, boys, never go on, boys. This was a noteworthy victory for Harrison and the Indiana 70th and the Union Army at Resaca. He got high praise from the commanding generals, both William Sherman and Joseph Hooker. More importantly, he got praise from home. His father heard about the victory and sent him a letter of congratulations, which meant a lot to Benjamin Harrison. He noted in his diary that I am glad that I have been able to show them all that I could hold a creditable place in the Army as well as in civil life and that if not the most petted one in the family, its famous name is as safe in my keeping as in that of any who bear the name. This was a big burden that Harrison carried on his shoulders. He was really pleased to get this letter from his father. But there was no rest for the Indiana 70th. Just a couple of weeks later, now the end of May in 1864, they had another fight at New Hope Church. This was the entire brigade was under uh, Harrison in this case because General Ward had actually been injured in the fighting at Rosaka. It was heavy fighting again. Once again, Harrison ordered a bayonet charge. It was a victory followed up by another tough fight and another victory at Golgotha Church. Now it's mid-July, 1864, and the Union Army is on the outskirts of Atlanta. General John Hood of the Confederates is in charge, and he is getting desperate. He decided to take a bold move, to take his men from out behind his works, and they take the fight to the enemy, and they did so at Peach Tree Creek. That was the center point, and guess who was there? the Indiana 70th and Benjamin Harrison and his men. Now, he made a decision not to just sit back and try to absorb the blow. He told his men to attack against Hood and his Confederates, and things looked pretty bad at first. The rebels actually captured a battery, a Union battery. They turned the Union gun on the Union men, but Harrison, again, wasn't going to back away. He prodded his men to attack. They recaptured those guns, avoided disaster. Many felt that the battle at Peachtree Creek was the finest hour of the war for Benjamin and Harrison. In fact, General Hooker wrote, Harrison, by God, I'll make you a brigadier for this fight. Well, he wasn't promoted just yet. First, they had to finish the fight, take the battle for Atlanta. That was a Union victory by the end of September of 1864. Lincoln was thrilled, of course, because this was the military victory that helped propel him to his election, re-election victory a couple of uh, months later. It was also an opportunity for Harrison to get a break. He got a furlough. He was able to head home. First time he'd been home in a couple of years. He got a hero's welcome in Indianapolis, reuniting with his family. Did a bit of a recruitment drive to try to replace some of the soldiers who had been uh, lost in battle so far. He did take to the stump to briefly uh, campaign to get his re-election, which he did win, but he was anxious to get back to his men. He was going back when he got stuck. Dalton, Georgia, again, was the nexus point. The railroads there had been severely damaged by the Confederates, couldn't get through right now. So temporarily, he was ordered back to Nashville, got involved in a direct fight there. It was successful. He then became ill. He caught scarlet fever, which knocked him out of action for about three weeks and gave him some time to think. He contemplated life after the war. And Harrison noted in his diary that on one point, my mind is fully made up. And that is that I will never again make myself a slave to my business as I did for several years before going into the army. I'm sure we shall be a happy, happier family with a smaller income and more time spent in domestic and social intercourse. At least that was his strategy. The promotion did come through. It was actually March of 1865. And he finally was able to get together with his men. It'd been about six months since he had connected with the Indiana 70th. They reunited at Hilton Head and they were able to celebrate because this is now April of 1865, and Confederate General Robert E. Lee had just surrendered to Ulysses Grant. His army was out of the war. They then had the sadness just a few days later when they heard of the assassination of the President Abraham Lincoln. Harrison reflected on Lincoln, qualities of heart and mind combined to make a man who has won the love of mankind. He stands like a great lighthouse to show the way of duty to all his countrymen and to send afar a beam of courage to those who beat against the winds. Lincoln was gone, but they were able to have the victory for Grant. 
But there was still an army in front of them. This is the Army of the Tennessee that Harrison is part of, with General Sherman going up against General Joe Johnston of the Confederates. But Johnston realized that the fight was over. April 26th, he surrenders to Sherman. The Civil War is over. All that was left in uniform was a chance to celebrate. Big parade was scheduled for the end of May of 1865. The new president, Andrew Johnson, is there. Ulysses Grant, the commanding general, they called it the Grand Review at Washington. General George Meade's Army of the Potomac marched on day one. General Sherman's Army of the Tennessee marched on day two, including Brigadier General Benjamin Harrison. A couple of weeks later, he is discharged from the army, immediately left for home. He's still only 31 years old. What's he gonna do next? That's the story for another day. That is Benjamin Harrison and the war years from the life of Benjamin Harrison. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.